Are you ready for some high adventure coming up next on the Mutual Audio Network? The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Hey, strangers. Well, at this point, you're more like family, right? You've stuck around over a year. I'm the writer, producer, and voice of Frank Dixon, Ian Knowles. I can't tell you how crazy it is for me to go from concept to published audio drama. Neon Shadows is my first script ever put into action, and my first time voice acting for anything other than charity radio spots. To be honest, I always thought I'd never be the person who could get something like this rolling. But through all the imposter syndrome, coordinating a team, and long nights editing just figuring it out with bloodshot eyes and cup of coffee in hand, I felt a spark for something like I've never felt before. If there's an experience I want out of audio fiction, or a story I'd like to see out there in the creative space, then I need to put it there myself, and trust myself to do it. Of course, I couldn't do it without the cast, especially the ones encouraging me right from the start. Dan and Amber, the voices of Dusty and Cordelia respectively, were the first to put both feet in, and they were passionate about joining me on this journey. Then Sean, Tyler, and Logan jumped on board and I got to writing. Tyler, Amber, and I started working on the music, and despite many setbacks and COVID-19, it all worked out. We did what we could remotely, and only one person could record in studio at a time. Our second season was much of the same, but we had some experienced voice actors such as Ellie Hirschman, Blythe Renee, and David Alt hop on board, inspiring us to work even harder. We also found some needles in the haystack, Tim Duplissy and Christian Reeve. Christian helped immensely with the side characters, and Tim is striking fear into the hearts of our characters as the unstoppable demon, Andras. This is the finale of Season 2, but it won't be the end of Neon Shadows. We're currently writing Season 3 and recording for our one-off episodes that will be distributed to Patreon patrons and Apple Podcast paid subscribers. Now the main story will always be free, of course, and available everywhere you listen to podcasts, so you won't miss out on anything for Season 3. We wanted to have bonus episodes available to those going the extra mile and show our appreciation. I just wanted to say, on behalf of the cast and myself, thanks for listening and enjoy the show. I walked inside first, wearing a hat to obstruct the profile of my face. The first floor was the concierge, a food court, and a bar. Naturally, I strode towards the scent of a buffet and a scotch. I would sit at the bar till Ulysses came in. It's not like I was on holiday, though. I had to make up for weeks of casing that we didn't have time for. In the span of about 20 minutes, I watched the exits and the general flow of people as I finished a meal. Nothing out of the ordinary, just your average day of business and leisure. And I made my way to the bar where I would be making contact with my conspirator. After a drink, I noticed about every 15 minutes or so, there was an armed man in an elevator on the second floor. He rode all the way to the top, was gone for a time, then came back down. That could be a way into the penthouse. Okay, so there is a viable route. I'll just have to relieve him of his guard duty when the time comes. 
Now to watch for maintenance staff. Conveniently, the elevator was encased in translucent glass. It only took a few moments to realize they always seemed to get on on the third floor. Ulysses plopped down next to me and ordered a Shirley Temple. It kind of made me feel guilty. I guess it wasn't the best idea to drink on the job, but oh well, here I was. You see anything good? People watching is always fascinating. But you know what's surprising? The maintenance staff is on the third floor. You'd think most of their work would be on the first floor. That is odd, isn't it? Do you know where I can unload some propane? I'm sitting on quite a bit. I hear there's a guy looking to buy on the second floor. If the price is right. Heard his office has a good view of the parking lot. Thank you, sir. This is just what I need to get business booming again. We enjoyed our coded conversation and puns a little too much. A little levity and alcohol helped keep my nerves in check. Ulysses went up to the maintenance floor and returned in his new duds. A gray jumpsuit with the Phantom Corp logo. He walked outside and came back with Cordelia and a dolly of propane tanks. That's my cue to leave and get ready for the finale. I paid my bartender with enough extra to supplement the fact that I was putting him out of work for a couple days. And as I left the lobby and went back towards the parking lot, I passed Dusty. The second floor is where I'd like to work. Is that where the most security is? Yeah, he even has a gun and access upstairs. Gotcha. Dusty gave me a wink and I went back to the car to wait my turn. Okay, second floor it is. There's an armed guard that needs us armed. He also has the access we need and it's up to me to get us up there. I passed the concierge desk and got in the elevator on the second floor. A brief ride and I was offloaded. I sat to read a newspaper on a couch in the second floor's small lounge area. It seemed like there was mostly brokers and lawyers on this floor, judging by the conversations overheard. There was a small security kiosk on the other side of the elevator. An overweight man stuffed his face with flaky pastry showering crumbs over his barely fastened shirt buttons. If I ever get like that, just kill me where I stand. I waited for what felt like too long. I wasn't sure where this executive security guy was, but I was worrying I misunderstood Frank. The phone rang at the kiosk and it slipped twice through the glazed fingers of the officer before he finally gripped the receiver. There's no women on the maintenance staff. Those guys fix things, not stand around bitching about how you're doing it wrong. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll check in on it. That didn't sound good. Looks like Cordelia's cover was blown. There was bound to be snags in our last second operation. I followed the guards into the elevator. He pushed the number three and smudged it with the byproduct of his sweets. Disgusting. When he looked away, I wiped it with my shirt. Maybe I could just toss him out of the window. Wouldn't that be good enough of a distraction? The door slowly opened with a ding and the officer stepped forward with me stitched to his shadow. We took a right, then a left. Seemingly this whole wing was maintenance and staff only. I'm surprised with all the employees Cordelia was even noticed. And because of this restriction, I put significant space between me and the guard. In the hall there was uniforms for security, maintenance, and kitchen staff in the bins that must have been returned from bulk laundering. Couldn't hurt to snag a chef's coat, just in case I'm discovered. I put it on while still pursuing the officer. I lost sight of him after another corner. There was an open door I assumed he walked in. In the doorway, he stood, nightstick drawn and hand on a phone. Hey, don't move. You don't work here. And this is the wrong place to be trespassing. Hey, big guy. How about you let us off with a warning? We're real sorry. I looked around to find a large wrench on the cart. This will have to do. I grabbed it and before the officer could dial, I cracked him over the head. He dropped like a ton of bricks, shaking pieces and parts on the shelves adjacent. <laughs> Dusty to the rescue. If someone called him, there'll be more people checking up on us. We gotta get these tanks into position on the second floor. Did you find a way to get us into the executive suites? No. I'm guessing you threw off the guard rotation. L let's just get going. 
Okay, I've set the propane tanks to detonate on a timer. It's rudimentary, but it will do. We put the newly rigged tanks back up on the dolly and took them to the elevator. Why are we blowing these on the second floor instead of the first? Well, we found out armed security with penthouse clearance comes to floor two. Hopefully, when these blow, we can take him by surprise. Leaving a lot to chance, aren't we? What choice do we have? We took the elevator down a floor and got off. Cordelia and Ulysses pushed their load ahead of me, and I hung behind waiting for our private invitation to the top floor. After about ten minutes, a well-dressed man with a holstered pistol got off and looked around. Where the hell are you, Lee? (sighs) Probably in the fucking food court again. You looking for a security guard? A big guy? Usually at the kiosk? Yeah, you seen him? Yeah, he was in here. I took him to an office I had previously noticed someone locked up for the day. He was frustrated at the locked door but pulled out his skeleton key. I needed that key for the elevator. He walked inside and I shut the door behind us. The hell? Who are you trying to pull? What the fuck? What the fuck? Ah! Who needs a chef's jacket when you've got a $200 suit? And a key to the penthouse of Phantom? Oh, wow. Where did you find the time for a wardrobe change? Is that the key? Yes, sir. Well, good, because we have ten minutes before the north face of the building is exploding. Let's wait in the lobby for Frank. The anticipation was building in me. I was finally going to get what I came for. We waited in the lobby, but no Frank. What now? Was there another hiccup? Was there... The lobby filled with people screaming and running in a flood towards the exit. Panic was heard throughout the entire lobby and even the floors above. I saw through the back of the elevator that security went to levels 2 and 3. Hey, sorry I'm late, but I didn't want to be on the side of the building where the things were blowing up, so I found a back door. Sir, madam, here are your scatter guns. Let's get to it. Sirens pulsed in the distance and I saw cruisers fill the lot and establishing a perimeter. So far, we were still holding the plan together by a hair. All of a sudden, security now filed out of the elevator onto the first floor. We opted to use the stairs for a few floors first to avoid the bulk of traffic. When we made it to the fourth floor, we exited the stairwell and ran to the elevator. We had to utilize every second that Joe could buy us. I put the key into the console and hit the button for the penthouse. Nothing happened. After a few tries in vain, the door shut and the elevator went down instead of up. Someone had called it to floor three. The doors opened and five armed guards entered the elevator then push the button for the executive's office one floor shy of the penthouse. You're going to the offices, right? Play it cool, kid. We got a long ride. Uh, yeah. You left your key in here. Oh yeah, thanks. (laughs) Haven't seen you guys up there before. I'm guessing you're working on Project Ares. Yeah, we are. uh, Lots of groundbreaking stuff. All the civilians evacuated by now. There's no structural damage, but I'm surprised you're still working after that explosion. Phantom's a real slave driver, eh? Yeah, burning the candle at both ends. You know how it is. (laughs) Frank pulled his shotgun out from behind his coat and gripped the handle tight. I felt a bead of sweat roll down my face. The tension in this tight metal and glass box was heavy in the air. It weighed down on my chest, only allowing short labored breaths. I didn't have the room to use the wolf here. If there was a fight, I wouldn't be of much help. I put my hand on the pistol in my pocket. Yeah, Project Ares is special. Uh, Yeah, this could change the world. You know what the best thing is about Project Ares? What's that? There is no Project Ares. Shit. As soon as the guard turned to face us, Frank put a hole through him. The other four scrambled to pull their guns. Ulysses grabbed scrap from its sheath on Frank's belt and stabbed it into an officer. Cordelia shot her shotgun at another guardsman before he could clear his holster. Bullets ricocheted and casings dropped to the ground. Two men were left with guns drawn. They both went to fire but locked arms with Frank and Ulysses pushing them into a corner incidentally trapping Cordelia as well. Light shone off a gun held by the staff guard. He fired a shot into Frank's shoulder and I shot him dead. I didn't have a shot on the other two without hitting one of my friends and they were too big and too strong to pull off. 
kid. Use your hands. Like when you were mad earlier. What? Remember? Oh, yeah. They took Sam away. Nothing could make me angrier. My nails elongated, my fingers followed. Dark, bristled hair jutted from my pores. A guard contending with Frank turned his barrel to me and shot. I covered my face and my hands flinched instinctively. Horror grew on the officer's face. I opened my closed palm to reveal a bullet. The one he fired at me. I can catch bullets now? I threw my claws into the guard's throat and ripped out the flesh and chunks of something else. Frank and Ulysses pushed the last standing officer back. He went to fire his gun, but I grabbed it with my claws and crushed it under my oppressive strength. I pulled scrap from the dead man's body and threw it to Frank. He caught it and ran the blade into the guard's chin and up through the soft pallet, killing him instantly. We all sat out of breath and covered in blood, amazed that we escaped with our lives. The elevator reached the executive suites. I tried using the key to go to the penthouse, but it seemed a different key was required. Looks like we need another key. I snatched the keys off of all the security guards. Four or five didn't work. But the leader who discovered we were imposters, his key was different. There was an inscription of an S encircled by olive branches on it. Maybe some kind of Storelli family crest? I put it in and pressed the button for the penthouse again. Finally, it lit up. It was time for our final act. Ready your weapons, everyone. We don't know what's waiting for us. We did just that. The door opened and there was a hall that split into two divergent paths. Guards could be heard coming from the right. Okay, let's go left. Not so fast, kid. Look, we're leaving a trail. Bloody footprints led from the elevator right to us. Dusty and Ulysses, you go ahead. Frank and I got this, right? Yeah, we'll handle these guys and catch up with you. First, let me put this body in the door of the elevator so that it can't be called down for reinforcements. I like the way you think. Okay, guys. Don't go getting yourselves killed. I would try to persuade you against this, but that is a fool's errand for either of you. Come on, Ulysses. Two unarmed men. Butlers, maybe. At the end of the hall, open the doors. Good day. Gareth awaits you on the roof. There went the surprise factor. He was waiting on us. After letting us in, the doors were shut and locked behind us. I'm fairly confident I could get back through the door if I wanted to, but that will have to wait. We walked into the master bedroom with a balcony that gave access to the roof. A man burst from the closet and ran at Ulysses with a knife, knocking him onto the bed. The assassin put two hands on his dagger and bared down. Ulysses held him back with one arm placed under the man's hands. Before I could even help, Ulysses used his free hand to fire a bolt into the assailant's chest from his crossbow. The man tumbled back, crashing into the closet door where he came, then died. Full of tricks, aren't they? Are you surprised they don't fight fair? Not in the slightest. We continued onto the metal staircase leading to the roof. Climbing to its top revealed a small army of goons and Gareth in the center of the rooftop. Furnished to look like a lounge in ancient Greece, an elaborate fountain sculpted into marble women holding jars was a grand focal point. Rows of stone columns held up lattice canopies of ivy and grapevine. The one saving grace of this being our arena was the ample cover which we would need being outnumbered 10 to 1. You finally made it. Despite your attempts to keep us from arriving at all. You'll have to excuse me, I can get very anxious waiting around. I'm not the kind of guy who sits twiddling his thumbs all day. Is this all the men you have left? Did we kill everyone else you sent our way? You know you guys, I'm the one who's been tearing through your ranks. One? By one? By one? All of you leave! It's your last chance! It seems your little stunt downstairs has prevented reinforcements, and these cowards are shitting their britches. However, all I need is me. A few of his subordinates dropped their guns and ran. Gareth shot some of them as they did. Just a few men remained at his side, but hardly out of loyalty. He smirked. That bastard was smiling. Enough. Come on, little puppy. I'll put you down. I'M GONNA RIP THAT SMILE OFF OF YOUR FACE! I can't believe they're going blow for blow. How is Gareth this strong? I can't shoot lest I hit Dusty. Even as the wolf, the poison could still kill him. Hurry up, Frank.
Well, I'm running out of ammo. I only got a few more shells. You hear that? Looks like Captain Ahab got his white whale. Don't shoot! We just want to get out of here. Guys, stop shooting. Gareth wants us all to die with him. These are the psychos ripping through our stash. What? Let's scratch Yeah, We don't get paid that good. What the hell just happened? Shocker. People scared of a giant werewolf. Well, when you put it like that, let's go catch up. Can't let the kid have all the fun. We ran upstairs through a bedroom and out onto a metal staircase. Bodies littered the landing and rooftop. Ulysses was perched behind a column, staying out of sight, most likely waiting for an opportunity to hit Gareth with no collateral damage. He looked at me and I nodded, taking cover with Cordelia in the next row of columns. Cordelia drew her shotgun towards my head and I ducked as she fired. What the hell was that about? I was interrupted by the body of a man plopping through the wooden grate above. Buckshot to the chest and legs still dangling in the air caught in the noose of vines. You're welcome. How do we help Dusty? This fight is looking a little too close. Let's get closer and wait for a chance. We positioned ourselves about 30 feet away from the melee. Gareth landed a right hook to the wolf causing him to backpedal. The wolf charged smashing Gareth into a wall, cracking it. Gnashing teeth and slicing claws left lacerations all over his arms. Gareth grabbed a cinder block and smashed it over our friend. I went to help but Cordelia and Ulysses held me back. Not yet. I didn't like seeing Dusty get beat on, even if he was tough as nails in that form. Small chunks of cement clacked to the floor after a vigorous dog-like shake. Gareth grabbed the wolf by the throat and put his leg behind the wolf, stripping him backwards. Gareth jumped on top, slinging punches one after another, none of them finding an impact through Dusty's guard. Ulysses ready to bolt and aimed his crossbow. He squeezed the trigger and an arrow loosed. Gareth turned just in time to notice and dodged it. <laughs> You're gonna have to do better than- <laughs> The wolf sunk its ice-picked teeth into the mob enforcer's throat, which opened like a floodgate. Dusty stood up and returned to his human form, stumbling towards us. Cordelia ran out to catch him before he fell to the ground. That fight took everything out of him. Gareth was a tough son of a gun but it was over for him now. He spat up blood while his neck produced a steady stream. I walked up to him. I only had two bullets, but they both had his name on him. Or was that too merciful for a monster who murdered my friend, killed cops by the dozen, and started the search for this evil box unleashing God knows what onto this earth? I lowered my gun, however. I remembered where my cruelty and vengeance had gotten me before. I didn't want to remain tainted, addicted to slurping up the dark ichor of revenge. If there was a moment that time stood still, enabling me to break the cycle, it was now. I spit on Gareth, looking up at me with anger. Instead of the pleading eyes I expected, I turned to walk away towards Dusty and the gang, but I heard whispers. And Gareth was saying something. New set? Too innocent? Fine, I'll indulge the dying this once. I squatted down next to Gareth. He motioned me closer. I briefly took inventory of any weapons he could have had, but he was broken and destroyed. No danger here. I leaned in. That's, that's two in a set. <laughs> you really are a lunatic. You wanted to waste your last words on ravings. Fine by me. Two and a set. In a set. Frank, get away from him. He has the other medallion, the bear totem. I started to run away from Gareth as his body shifted into something awful. He was even bigger than the wolf. The bear had pitch black fur with patches missing filled with oozing blood like it had mange. It was grotesquely horrifying. In the shadow of the beast I felt small. Smaller than when we fought the undead kobold which was three times the size of Gareth even now. When he walked it cracked the ground underneath. We needed to get out of here. You shouldn't have crossed me. This will be your grave. Frank! 
And I woke up from a brief blackout across the roof from everyone else. And I was slumped against the wall. I couldn't feel my left arm and I felt my chest a little too much. White hot magma filled my lungs with every breath. <sighs> he had sent me flying. And it felt like I got hit by a truck. Gareth lumbered towards me, a drool pouring onto the cracking concrete. And I heard gunfire and a crossbow bolt, and it was hard to focus. I leaned in and squinted my eyes to see the bear break Ulysses' crossbow in half with one bite. Part of it jammed the bear's jaws open. Ulysses pulled something out of his pocket and shoved it in the creature's mouth. He covered his ears and a BANG bellowed from the bear, causing it to whine in pain. But it still had little effect on Gareth. He headbutted Ulysses and sent him limp to the ground. My vision blurred in my periphery. I tried to prop myself up with my right arm, but I didn't have the strength. I fell forward attempting to crawl. I wormed forward a few feet. Gareth grabbed Cordelia, cutting into her arms with his claws. He lifted her up and threw her into a column, toppling it over onto her. I crawled about ten more feet. I tried to ignore the fading of my vision and just press on. Dusty scrambled to his feet partially in wolf form, enabling him to lift the column off of Cordelia. Gareth took a broken chunk of the pillar and batted Dusty aside. And I was almost there. The pillar raised once more over it, down Dusty, now weak and fully human. As the bear brought it down, I grabbed my gun that laid where I stood before getting blindsided. I fired a shot hitting Gareth in his hulking shoulders. He threw the column down and lurched towards me. I had one more bullet. The bear moved forward staring at me for a moment. I took my last shot hitting him in the face, severing strands of hair which floated to the ground beside me. Gareth lifted his foot and brought it down on my leg, crushing it. My bones burst like a candy cane smacked with a hammer. My vision tunneled, and I vomited. My eyes started closing involuntarily, and I felt the bear's giant paws pick me up to its eye level. A wet snout dripped with slime, and hot rancid breath gusted into my face. My head rolled back and I looked up at the sky. The first snowfall had started, and the flakes were cool on my skin. See you soon, lady. saved by another beast. Dusty? No. I could still hear him breathing heavily to my left. Looking up I saw a battle between monsters. The angel's hellhound was shredding the flesh off of Gareth and taking no quarter. The bear looked panicked and jumped causing the floor beneath them to crumble and fall through. He used this opportunity to make a break for it and escape down the side of the building. Gareth was afraid of the Hellhound, and thank God for that, but where was Angel? As soon as I thought her name, she walked in front of my waning vision. Thanks. I didn't do it for you. I did it for my sister. Lady. Well, stranger, we appreciate you stopping by to spend some time with us in the shadows. If you want more Neon Shadows, head over to at Neon Shadows Pod on all social media and check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Neon Shadows Pod. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. The cast of this episode was Dusty Willis voiced by Dan Faulkner, Cordelia voiced by Amber Wren, 
Frank Dixon, voiced by Ian Knowles. Detective Joe Sutton, voiced by Tyler Brown. Gareth, voiced by David Alt. Angel, voiced by Blythe Rene. And Ulysses, voiced by Sean Goodrich. The theme song is Neon Shadows, performed by Amber Wren, written by Tyler Brown and Ian Knowles. Neon Shadows was created and written by Ian Knowles. All rights reserved, copyright Blunderbuss Studios 2021. Reuse or reproduction of our content is strictly prohibited. This is Thursday Thrillers, audio with action on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow on Mutual with Friday Follies, the end of the week collection of comedy cut-ups. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy. Or find the Friday Follies feed in your favorite podcast players. Now that's a lot of F's. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.